Roy, I've been obsessed with consciousness my whole life. I did a doctorate in neuroscience. I'm not sure that helped me very much with understanding <laughs> consciousness. Um, but people are all over the lot on consciousness. Uh, some people ask, what is it good for? Why did it emerge? And then people develop evolutionary psychology theories. Uh, from your perspective as a social psychologist, really looking at behaviors of individuals and groups, what can you say about consciousness? What's it good for? I think many people are skeptical of consciousness because they take this artificial intelligence or neuroscience approach of thinking of uh, an isolated individual, uh, and they say, well, if unconscious thoughts in your mind can cause behavior, what added value is there for being conscious? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very hard to answer that. But if you understand consciousness as a way that we relate to each other, uh, that makes it much clearer. So if I can have the thought in my mind, don't put your hand in the fire, and it makes me not put my hand in the fire, okay, that's a benefit. Uh, but uh, why does that thought have to be conscious? An unconscious thought could do just as well. I got no answer to that. But talking is always conscious. You can't share information without being conscious of what you're saying. So if I can tell my children, don't put your hand in the fire, and they don't, well, that has a clear benefit for me. Mm. Uh, so when we understand conscious thinking is for for talking and communicating, for participating in the social group, uh, then I think it's much easier uh, to come up with an understanding of why this is an important capacity and why this is so uh, so vital. And so do you see that in an evolutionary context? Absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, I think uh, humans evolved uh, uh, new mental uh, states and new capacities uh, specifically for communicating. I mean, the, I'm thinking now the key human trait, the, the, the essence of what set us off on our unique path in evolution uh, was communication. As you know, when uh, evolutionary theorists first started uh, thinking about humans, they said, uh, well, the big brain is the key. Uh, we're intelligent, homo sapiens, we named us, and uh, so that's why we developed an upright posture, so we wouldn't bonk our big brains <laughs> on the ground. Uh, and then once we were rocking upright, we had our hands free so we could make tools, and it was all great. That theory was demolished when they discovered Australopithecus, who already walked upright but had a tiny little pea brain. So the question is, two questions really, why the upright posture, which set us apart from the other uh, apes, and what did get uh, intelligence evolving. I think the best answer uh, is that the upright posture was to use the hands for communicating. Communicating. There's a pretty good case that gesture preceded speech, mm -hmm. uh, and even today, two humans, if we don't speak the same language, we start communicating by gesture. Uh, one, another sign of this is we can teach a couple of the other primates to communicate by gesture, but none of them can talk because they don't have enough control. So the, the, the movement of the larynx and all the other things that made speech possible, that came after communication was already established. Yeah. And that, too, that answers the second question about uh, why did humans become intelligent? Why did the brain size increase? Once we're sharing information, uh, then there's a lot more information. And so any improvement in capacity to store, to manipulate, to work on that information uh, would uh, confuge, confer a huge uh, advantage in, uh, uh, in evolutionary competition. They're not the same thing, though, intelligence and consciousness. We can, Absolutely not. We can say a machine is intelligent by a lot of different characteristics, right. and certainly now there's no conscious machine. Whether there ever could be is, is controversial, right. but, but it's not controversial whether the machines can be intelligent. Absolutely. Um, and much, uh, much of the work of intelligent thought is carried out uh, unconsciously. Uh, consciousness, again, kind of is on the surface, and it's, again, useful for what's going out and coming in. Uh, another crucial thing that the conscious mind can do that the unconscious mind does not seem to be so good at uh, is putting together strings of words. Uh, the unconscious can understand single words. Mm. Uh, there are all these subliminal prime, priming, or uh, if people are listening to different things, you have headphones on and list of words in one ear and uh, speech in the other, and you're supposed to ignore the speech and uh, focus on the words and so on. You can hear individual words from what you're not attending to and be affected by them, even if you're not conscious of that. Mm. Uh, the unconscious will respond to single words, but never sentences. Mm. Logical reasoning is another way of constructing sequences of thought. Uh, but And that appears to be quite specific to consciousness. The unconscious is not so good at logical reasoning. Uh, so all these things suggest an idea that the conscious mind is a place where the unconscious mind, and they work together, constructs these meaningful sequences. Uh, 
we have to be conscious of what we're saying. It's it's almost impossible to carry on a conversation while you're thinking about something mm -hmm. else. Right. Uh, so uh, there's a clear requirement. There's something that consciousness can do that the unconscious can't. And, and I think, again, consciousness for helping us understand each other, uh, to communicate uh, both input and output, uh, those are really important social functions that enable human groups to do things that no other groups can do. Lots of other animals hunt together, but they hunt in packs, they just all do the same thing, they swarm or, or whatever. Humans can make a plan, they can argue about the plan, no, let's go this way, no, let's go this way. Uh, they can all represent in their minds the various plans that are being discussed, they can all agree on one and carry out their roles. Uh, and so even, you know, we are not particularly fierce by animal standards, we don't have fangs or anything <laughs> like that, but we are the best hunters mm. on the planet because of this uh, communication and this ability to coordinate. The picture sounds very rational. The problem I have is that in uh, uh, determining through evolution our physical characteristics and how we get different uh, postures and different uh, uh, limbs, all that makes sense. They're all of the same kind, same category. But we talk about consciousness, that's a totally different category. Nothing like it we can imagine in the physical universe until we found consciousness. Uh, does that trouble you? Well, that troubles everybody. <laughs> uh, the, what's called the hard problem of consciousness of how inanimate uh, physical things can produce subjective experience, nobody has a clue and uh, everybody's very interested and uh, uh, you know, would like. So yes, that is a, a troubling uh, uh, problem for everyone. Uh, in terms of consciousness, most people write about it distinguished two levels. Uh, there's one that we share in common with other animals uh, and one that seems to be more uniquely human. Uh, animals are different from plants. Plants don't need a central nervous system. They don't need to bring all the information together so they can decide what to do, because they don't do that much. Uh, and they can grow over here, and it doesn't matter whether the other side does. But an animal's going to walk this way. The whole animal has to walk this way. <laughs> so it needs a central processing. So uh, there is, we believe, most people believe, uh, some lower level or different level of consciousness in other animals where there's a central experience of the world, information is gathered, uh, and uh, behavior is controlled to some degree. Uh, there's another level or another kind that's more distinctively human with symbolic representations, simulations away from the here and now, self-awareness, uh, all these other things that, uh, uh, th that make us distinctively human. But So in that sense, human consciousness is not uh, not uh, coming out of nowhere, it's an improvement over what uh, uh, our evolutionary forebears and animals had. The big mystery is how the, the first kind of animal consciousness got started uh, so that there was some awareness, some subjective experience of the world. Once you have that, then the human you can see as a refinement with some uh, additional features uh, to enable us to, uh, to function as we do.